2020 and our today's topic is research and development. We are organizing this session on behalf of Institute of Palmo Care and Research and to speak about this topic of research and development, we have our eminent speakers with us. But before introducing the speakers, I would like to take the opportunity to introduce our chairperson of today's session. And treat different monetary problems with him, and he had the problems credit. Now, I would request Sir P. S. Patacharya to kindly introduce our speakers for today's session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Shikta. It's and my colleague uh, faculty to the module of Palmocon today. This is actually on uh, the research scenario of India, the difficulties of research. Uh, research is somewhat foreign to us because we are so much bogged down in uh, our day-to-day -day patient care that uh, most of us do not bother to do research. But if you look at the global scenario, if you want to progress, you know, research must be integrated with our practice. And I'm sure that the scenario is changing out here and it will be changed faster tomorrow. To deal with um, uh, today's topic, we have got uh, uh, two very eminent faculty. One is uh, my good friend, who is, we will be uh, invited right now, Dr. Parvez Ekal. Dr. Parvez is a professor of um, internal medicine, infectious disease and pulmonology in Sheri Kashmir Hospital uh, Medical Institute in uh, Srinagar. He is an outstanding academician and um, he is involved in a lot of serious researches in collaboration with um, uh, both um, international authorities from England and US. He works with the Wellcome Foundation. He works with the CDC Atlanta. Apart from that, he's also attached uh, in research connection with the University of Utah and other foreign universities. His work on hydrated disease of lungs is um, really pioneering work and it's been eye-opening for me. When I read it in chest, uh, I felt it is a wonderful piece of collection of uh, data and we learned a lot from that. Um, his primary interest as it um, seems is uh, presently on epidemiology, on viral infections and on obstructive airway diseases. But why did I choose him for this particular topic? It's because that he reads a lot, he's a serious um, reader, and he is uh, the editor of Lung India. So today's topic is the best of five select selected papers uh, from Indian authors in 2019-2020. Uh, With these few words, may I request Parvez to um, join and uh, deliver. Thank you, Parvez. Thank you, Dr. Piyas uh, Bhattacharya. Thank you so much for having me uh, and for thanks a lot for this uh, very uh, generous introduction. And uh, I'd like to extend my thanks to your institute, the Institute, institute of Public Care, uh, for, for uh, uh, giving me an opportunity to share my, uh, my experiences. And you put me on, on a spot to select five best papers from Indian respiratory uh, researchers, and that's a very tough talk, to, uh, task. And I, I hope that uh, I've done justice with it. I picked up uh, the ones that actually I like, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they're the best. You could have, this, this is my collection and certainly could be uh, different from somebody else's perspective. And thank you for that. So let me share my screen, okay. Can you see my screen? Is my screen yes. visible? Okay, great. So thank you uh, again, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya. And uh, so I'll uh, talk about uh, the five best papers that I picked up uh, from uh, 2019 uh, end and 2020. The first paper I'm going to talk about is this phenotypic uh, comparison between smoking and non-smoking chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, it's very dear to me, COPD. I've been trying to work on it uh, for quite a time. And we, this is from the Pune group uh, led by Dr. Sandeep Salvi and was uh, published in Respiratory Research this year, uh, 2020. 
And uh, the background is that we know that uh, non-smoking COPD or the biomass fuel associated COPD is a distinct term and has come to be recognized as an important and probably more important than the smoker COPD over the past, uh, past few years. And uh, although uh, COPD is uh, common in non-smokers as well as a result of multiple exposures, little is about known about its phenotype. And, and what Dr. Salvis and his colleagues wanted to do, they compared the non-smoker COPD with smoking COPD patients in a rural Indian population using a variety of clinical, physiological, radiological, uh, inflammatory uh, markers in the sputum and blood biomarkers. So uh, they recruited subjects who were more than 40 years of age, and uh, they were um, randomly selected from rural communities of Pune. Uh, and uh, they divided them into three groups. One was healthy, then second was smoker COPD, and third was the non-smoker COPD. Healthy people were those who were otherwise fit and we, we had no symptoms, no underlying disease, no hospitalizations for any disease-related event in the past, a normal clinical examination reported by a pulmonologist, normal X-ray chest and normal spirometry. Those uh, who had smokers COPD were those who defined as tobacco smokers for at least 10 pack year history of cigarette or BD smoking, who had no other respiratory diseases like asthma based on history, clinical examination and radiological findings, and who had a post bronchodilator FE1, FEC ratio of less than 70%, that would be a fixed ratio, and a FE1 of less than 80%. Non-smoker COPDs were those who were exposed to a biomass smoke for at least two hours a day for 20 years and were subject subjects exposed to occupational risk factors associated with COPD for about 20 years, who had no other respiratory disease based on clinical history and clinical examination, had no radiographic findings suggestive of any alternate uh, examination, alternate uh, diagnosis, and had a post bronchodilator uh, F1, FEC ratio of less than uh, 0.7 and uh, FE1 of less than 80% predicted. All non-smoking COPD patients were supposed to be non-smokers and none of them had a past or a current history of asthma. The study was done in a, uh, in a twin fashion. One was a cross-sectional co case control uh, model which examined the phenotypic differences between the smoker COPD and the non-smoker COPD. And the second part of the study was a longitudinal cohort study where healthy smoker COPD and non-smoker COPD patients were followed over a period of two years and they were compared with smoker COPD and healthy subjects. So 290 subjects, that was 110 healthy, 79 smoker COPDs, 93 non-smoker COPD performed pre and post bronchodilator spirometry and were followed for two years to study the annual rate of decline in lung function. In addition, they did body plethysmography, impulse oscillometry, inspiratory and expiratory HRCT, induced sputum uh, cellular profile, and blood biomarkers were compared among the healthy smoker COPD and the non-smoker COPD subjects. Spirometric response was also measured in 30 female non-smoker COPD patients took oral corticosteroids. This is how uh, the, they, they looked like. It, this is the healthy uh, patients, this is the smoker COPD, and this is the non-smoker COPD. So these are the three columns that are actually replicated in all these uh, figures. Uh, in the panel A, we have uh, the spirometry with FE1, FEC, and uh, we and this is FE1, that, or this is the FV, C and this is the FEF uh, 2575. This panel B depicts the lung volumes, that is the total lung capacity, the specific uh, airway conductance, and the specific airway resistance. And this is the impulse oscillometry showing the uh, resistance area under the uh, reactance, the, the AX reactance curve, and the resonant frequency. And you can see that there are differences in the three. So summarizing these differences, compared to all male smoker COPD, so we don't have um, female smoker COPD, 47% of non-smoker COPD were female. They were younger by 3.2 years, had a greater BMI, so they were on the overweight side, had a slower rate of decline in lung function over a period of two years, that is 80 versus 130 had more small airways obstruction, which was measured by impulse oscillometry, 
had significantly less emphysema, that was 29% versus 11% on CT scans compared to the smokers COPD, and had lower values in lung diffusion parameters. Significantly less neutrophils in induced sputum and tended to have more sputum eosinophils. Hemoglobin and red blood cell volumes were higher and serum insulin levels were lower in smokers COPD compared to non-smokers COPD. So this is an HRCT classification of smoker and non-smoker COPD, including the airway disease that you can see in the bulk of these patients had the airway disease. So airway disease was more common in non-smoker COPD that is typically by the small airways. And we had emphysema, as you can see, this is a compared to uh, bar of the smoker and the non-smoker COPD in terms of emphysema. And then we had some interstitial lung abnormalities, which were predominant seen in the non-smoker COPD patients. And there's a dot plot which shows the frequency of asthma, uh, emphysema, and uh, decreased attenuation of expiratory CT in smoker COPD and non-smoker COPD, as is depicted here. This is the healthy individuals. This is the emphysema in, in smoker COPD, and this is the non-smoker COPD. And uh, similarly here, this is the emphysema and this is the uh, decreased attenuation on the expiratory uh, CT. The bars and, the, uh, and depict the, these bars depict the median and the interquartile ranges. And as you can see that there's a significant difference between the uh, emphysema prevalence between the smokers and the non-smokers as well as uh, non-smokers as well as the healthy individuals. And this is a representative HRCT image of smoker COPD showing extensive central lobular uh, emphysema in upper lobes and non-smoker COPD showing generalized uh, decreased attenuation and some bronchial thickening. This is an inflammatory uh, cell markers in, in, in all these patients. This represents the total cell count, the macrophages, the neutrophils, the eosinophils, and the lymphocytes. And as you can see that there's a significant difference in the neutrophils as compared to the healthy individuals and to the non-smokers, uh, as well as in the eosinophil counts. This uh, graph shows the changes in FE1 and FEC after four weeks of uh, oral prednisone. As you can see, there's a non-significant uh, change after using oral prednisone, which would be ex expected in all COPD patients. And this is the longitudinal study where they looked at what happens to healthy individuals, those with uh, smoker COPD and those with the non-smoker uh, COPD. There were no significant difference seen between either COPD group in symptoms, activity, and impact scores over the two-year follow-up. Similarly, CAT scores did not significantly change over a two-year uh, period in either COPD group compared to baseline. So, Concluding from this important paper, which is probably one of the only studies comprehensively look at, looking at the physiological, radiological, and the longitudinal study of non-smoker versus smoker COPD, compared to smoker COPD, non-smoker COPD patients are likely to be younger. They're going to have a female gender most of the times, have a greater BMI, have more small airways obstruction, have less emphysema, less impairment in gas diffusion, less neutrophils in the sputum and more eosinophils, and a slower rate of decline in lung function. Spirometry indices and quality of life are similar between the smokers and the non-smoker COPD. No improvement occurred with oral corticosteroids, and uh, Dr. Salvi and his colleagues rightly uh, emphasized that further studies need to be done in order to find out what therapeutic interventions are appropriate in non-smoker COPD, and whether they manifest the same comorbidities as you have in uh, well defined in smoker COPD patients. The second study I uh, I picked up was uh, from uh, from Kolkata, led by Dr. Raja there and uh, and many other colleagues in in the country. This was looking at the bronchiectasis in country, and these were the results from the EMBARC, which is European Multi Center Bronchiectasis Audit and Research Collaboration, and there was under a group that's the Respiratory Research Network of India Registry. The background is that uh, the bronchiectasis is generally a neglected uh, chronic lung disease, it, though it's very common. Most epidemiological data are limited to uh, cohorts from Europe and the US with few data from the lower income and the middle income countries. The study was aimed to describe the characteristics, severity of disease, microbiology, and treatment of patients with bronchiectasis in India. It was a multi-center prospective observational cohort study 
Adult patients aged 18 years and above with CT confirmed bronchial cases were enrolled from 31 set centers across the country. Patients with bronchial cases due to cystic fibrosis or tra traction bronchial cases associated with any other respiratory dis disorder were excluded. Data were collected at baseline and with follow-up visits taking place at least once a year. Comprehensive clinical data were collected through a registry system, which is the same, which was uh, taken up from the Embark registry. Underlying etiology of bronchiectasis as well as treatment and risk factors for bronchiectasis were analyzed in the Indian limb of the registry. Comparisons with the demographics were made and they were made with published European and US registries. They were not uh, done concomitantly. They were compared with the published European and US registries and quality of care was benchmarked against the 2017 ERS guidelines. This is a snapshot of the, uh, the, the participating sites. As you can see, there's a fair representation of most of the country, except from probably the uh, North. Uh, there were 1,195 patients enrolled from June 2015 to September 2017. And these were the underlying causes of bronchial cases that were uh, found to be uh, causative in the Indian bronchial cases registry. As you can see, the tuberculosis constituted a significant number of uh, cases. Uh, being uh, responsible for causing bronchial cases in our 35% of the cases. Post-infective was in 22% of cases and idiopathic in 21. The rest of the causes included AVPA, chronic obstructive lung disease, asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, and other uh, disorders. This is a uh, uh, radiological distribution of the bronchial cases. And as you can see on either side, you can have the total uh, total numbers would be more than 100% because there would be a distribution of multi uh, lower uh, bronchial cases. This showed the dominant radiological pro uh, pattern, which was cystic and cylindrical uh, followed by varicose. Spirometric uh, patterns were obstructive. Uh, most of the patients did have around 40% had a normal spirometry. Low FEC was found in around 28% of the cases. Exacerbations, which were treated with oral antibiotics, was seen. Number of exacerbations was zero or one in most of the cases. In some cases, it was more than one. And uh, bronchial cases severity score was severe in around 35% uh, of the cases, moderate and mild. So how did the uh, Indian uh, practitioners, Indian pulmonologists or Indian uh, physicians treat these patients with? They were being treated with ICS or lava in, in a number of in cases, sometimes used lama, oral theophyllins and leukotrin antagonists. Airway clearance uh, agents like uh, acetylcysteine or others were used. Daily airway clearance was very frequent and was, uh, as was the use of uh, an acetylcysteine. Some did use nebulized saline as well. Macrolides or any other long-term antibiotic therapy was not used as a matter of routine. So uh, marked differences were observed between the India, Europe, and the USA. Patients in India were younger with a median age of 56 versus the European and the U US registries and were more likely to be men compared uh, to the other registries. Previous tuberculosis was the most frequent cause of underlying cause of bronchiectasis. Pseudomonas aeruginosa was the most common organism in sputum cultures. So risk factors for exacerbations of bronchiectasis included a male sex with an odds ratio of 1.17, pseudomonas uh, aeruginosa, colonization, history of pulmonary tuberculosis, MMRC score of uh, that actually uh, depicted the higher the score that was uh, ex ex uh, associated with the higher risk, daily sputum production, and the radiological severity of the disease. Low adherence to guideline recommended care was, recommend, uh, was observed, and only 388 patients were tested for AVPA, and 88 had been tested for immunoglobulins. So the interpretation by Dr. Dar and his Embark uh, colleagues from the country was that uh, they, this study highlighted the high severity and the high symptom burden associated with bronchial cases in India. It was likely to be replicated in similar countries with a high prevalence of tuberculosis and severe respiratory infections. Bronchial cases continues to be a neglected disease and the data suggests that and there's a need to improve access to basic care, interventions of bronchial cases like, like chest physiotherapy, vaccinations and, and long-term antibiotic uh, therapies. There is a discordance between the patient characteristics in India compared with those in the Europe and the US uh, registries and the data from high-income countries thus 
may not be generalizable to India and other Asian countries. And there's a need to do interventional studies to demo demonstrate improvements in clinical outcomes specifically in Asian countries. Uh, this study also could be uh, in the backdrop. Uh, there is a very recent paper published just last uh, week, where uh, which was led by Professor Jindal and Dr. Bhattacharya and I are uh, fortunate to be, have been a part of this uh, study, where we where demonstrated that non-smoker COPD uh, most commonly ob is observed in Indians, in women exposed to biomass fuels and are characterized by a higher rate of exacerbations and higher healthcare utilization. The third, uh, I mean, we know that the whole globe is actually consumed by SARS-CoV-2, and I couldn't help but uh, pick up a, a paper on zero prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 in slum versus non-slums in Mumbai. And uh, as you can see that uh, estimating zero prevalence is crucial for controlling the transmission of SARS-CoV-2. There are few published uh, zero surveys in low-income and middle-income countries, which comprise over two thirds of the confirmed cases of COVID-19. And India has uh, the dubious distinction of having the second highest number of COVID cases in the world. A total of 8,870 individuals for, were picked up from both slums and non-slum communities in Mumbai. And this was the distribution for, from various various areas, that is from Matunga, Chembur West, and Dahisa. Individuals who were aged 12 or older were eligible for uh, a venipuncture. Those who did not consent and had or had any contraindication to any puncture were excluded. Samples were tested for IgG antibodies to the nuclear capsid via chemisense by use of Abbott diagnostic test. And this is what they uh, found. Uh, this was the proportion correlation between the proportion of positive cases and the demographics. Uh, the, 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 the left hand sh shows the community uh, dependent variable. This is the age. And this shows the various proportion of non slum dwellers compared to the slum dwellers. As you can see, that the IgG positivity is much higher in the slum dwellers compared to the non slum dwellers. So, 54% of samples in slums and only 16% of samples in non slums tested positive, which was uh, significant statistically. Adjusted zero prevalences are higher in slums, meaning remains ranging from 55 to 61 than in non-slums ranging from 12 to 18 percent across world. Underlying IgG scores were higher and the positive test rate is more sensitive to the manufacturer's recommended cutoffs in slums than in non-slums. A high asymptomatic spread of the infection and infection fatality of 0.076 percent in slums and 0.26 percent, that's 0.27 percent in non-slums, which is higher in non-slums compared to the slums. The high prevalence of slums could be driven by a population density, lower adherence to distancing measures and poorer hygiene. And this stark variation in prevalence within wars also highlights the importance of geographic variations for epidemiological modeling and policy discussions of herd immunity, which actually concerns the whole globe this time. The fourth paper that I uh, picked up was the one from Orlando Institute of Medical Sciences by Dr. Srinath and other colleagues from Pulmonary Medicine Department and even from the uh, Pediatric Department and was published in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene uh, in this December. It is uh, looking at the regional pneumophila as a cause of uh, pneumonia in, in a referral hospital from 2015 to the five-year study. And uh, over the five years, they looked at 597 patients with radiologically confirmed pneumonia. They were enrolled. And respiratory excretions were uh, tested for Legionella pneumophila. And uh, in that, the testing included by a real time PCR and a culture. And a commercial urinary antigen test was also used to detect the Legionella serogroup 1 antigen in urine. A Legionella disease case was defined as a patient with a pneumonia and a positive result for Legionella species infection determined by either by a positive real-time PCR or a culture or a urinary antigen test. 14 of these patients were positive for Legionella pneumophila infection by either real-time PCR or a urinary antigen test. Eight were admitted to the ICU. Four were uh, recorded to have in-hospital deaths. Bivariate analysis showed that renal disease neurological conditions, confusion, leukocytosis, and recruitment of oxygen support. Requirement of oxygen support were more common in the regional positive cases than the regional negative cases. However, multivariate analysis 
fail to confirm most of these differences, renal disease being the only independent variable that remains significant. So it's important to recognize that regional anemophila should be thought of as an etiological agent so as to tailor your therapy accordingly. This uh, is in the backdrop of another paper which came from our group wherein we recruited 225 patients from 2012 to 2015. And we did the routine microbiology and also looked for uh, chlamydia, mycoplasma, Legionella, and pneumococcus. And Legionella was tested only by urinary antigen. Uh, and what we demonstrated was that of patients presenting to uh, us with community acquired pneumonia, commonest cause was streptococcus pneumonia in 30% of cases. Second uh, etiological agent that stood out was Legionella. So that is very important that we recognize it as an etiological agent, have it in mind once we are uh, thinking of empiric therapy for uh, our patients with, with, uh, with hospitalized, who are hospitalized with pneumonia. So we have to have an increased awareness, improved uh, diagnostic testing, which could facilitate early detection of cases, pathogen-directed therapy, and improved outcomes for our patients. The last study that uh, I picked up was from my own journal, was a clinical profile of lung cancer in North India. It's a 10-year analysis of around uh, 2,000 patients from a tertiary care hospital. It's again from Molina Industrial Medical Sciences. It was led by uh, Professor uh, Anant Mohan. And uh, what they looked was that the background was that over the uh, past uh, many years, the demographic profile of lung cancer has changed. However, most reports were uh, limited by small numbers in the country, short follow-ups, and uh, showed an inconsistent pattern. And a comprehensive evaluation of changing trends over a long period had not been done. So what they did was they, they looked at all consecutive lung cancer patients studied over a 10-year period from January 2008 to March 2018 and the All-Indian of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, and relevant clinical information and survival outcomes were analyzed. A total of 1862 patients were evaluated with a, with a mean age of 59 years, and that comprised of nearly 82% were, were males. Majority were smokers, and 72, 6% were smokers, with median smoking index of 500. Contrary to what had been happening in the past, adenocarcinoma was the second more, uh, was the most common uh, type of uh, histological type followed by squamous cell carcinoma and small cell lung cancer. So adenocarcinoma was seen in 34% of cases, small squamous cell carcinoma in 28% of cases, and small cell carcinoma in 16% of cases. This is uh, the pro mean age profile, as you can see, from 2008 to 2018. The mean age actually uh, went down in 2010 and uh, 11 and has actually come back to the same. I mean, it is now 57.81, whereas in 2008, it was around 58. And this is uh, the longitudinal uh, data about the proportion of females, as is seen in the uh, blue curve. You can see the proportion of females is, is actually increasing, whereas the smoking percentages are actually decreasing. This is the profile, uh, the absolute numbers over these years, as you can see, the SCC, adenocarcinoma, no small cell, uh, lung cancer, small cell lung cancer, and others. As you can see that there is a consistent increase in the number of cases of adenocarcinoma, as you can see, is going up to around 36.9% now, whereas uh, that of squamous cell carcinoma has uh, gone from um, the numbers of 25% in 2008, around 29% more or less steady. However, that of non-small cell lung cancer has, which is otherwise not specified, has gone down. Uh, this is the clinical uh, profile, uh, the, the histology compared with the smoking and the gender, as you can see here. This is the comparison of uh, Jotun Anant Mohan's study with other uh, studies having been done in the country uh, from time to time. And these are the various comparisons in terms of histopathological uh, types. So the conclusion of Dr. Anand Mohan's study was a total of uh, 1862 patients had been evaluated with mean age of 59, comprised of 82% males, majority were smokers, adenocea was the commonest, 
And over a 10 year period, adenocarcinoma increased from 9.5 to 35.9%. So there was nearly more than four times increase in the frequency of adenocarcinoma as the pathological subtype. Small cell, uh, squamous cell carcinoma actually uh, changed from 24, uh, 25 to 30%, and non small cell lung cancer, otherwise not specified, decreased from 49 to 21%. The proportion of females with lung cancer increased. Although smoking rates remain similar, majority of the uh, non-small cell lung ca cancer continue to be diagnosed at an advanced stage, that was stage three or four, wherein at what time our, our uh, therapeutic armamentarium is rather limited. They also looked at the uh, epidermal uh, growth uh, factor receptor EGFR mutations and the uh, ALK rearrangements were present in 25% and 11% of adenocarcinoma patients, which actually helps us in uh, target uh, chemotherapy, targeted chemotherapy. Median overall survival had actually uh, uh, been around 8.8 .8 months for all patients, and it was 12.57 months among the 10, 1,000 plus patients who were initiated on a specific therapy, be it chemotherapy, targeted therapy, radiotherapy, or surgery. Never smokers were younger, more likely to be female, and educated, had a higher prevalence of adenocarcinoma and EGFR ALK mutations, and had a better survival. So concluding, ladies and gentlemen, Indian research is fed, finding a better niche place in top-ranking global medical journals. There are collaborations that are increasing, like the BOLD study, the EMBARC study, the GLIMP study, and many others. There is an increasing involvement of Indian researchers in global burden of, uh, of disease studies, and India's specific data is being published, not only uh, in uh, Indian journals, but in credible, high-impact uh, international journals. And as such, Indian presence and impact is slowly but steadily increasing in research. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Parvez, for your beautiful uh, presentation. Now, may I allow a few questions, if anybody has? Uh, Shikta, would you be looking for if there is any question? Uh, sir, there is uh, only <clears throat> one question that mm. what's the leukocyte count? In what? Uh, they haven't mentioned. I think uh, Sir was uh, talking about that. Uh, blood profile hemo, uh, hemoglobin and all uh, which they have seen in non-smoker COPD so I think uh, it's related to that only what's the leukocyte count they have mentioned no if we talk of the uh, you talk of it, this is the uh, slide I think they would that would answer their question I'm not particularly sure that they're actually asking about the same but this is the total cell count as you can see there's not much of a difference however if you look at the neutrophils uh, as you see that there's a significant difference between the healthy and the non-smoker COPD, even between the non-smoker and the smoker COPD, and the smoker uh, uh, smoker COPD, and even the, the the healthy individuals. And this is also reflected in the eosinophils as well, as I said earlier. I hope that uh, I answered the correct question. I was not sure they were asking the same uh, about the same 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 study. I have a small question. The yes, zero yes. prevalence of um... Um, SARS-CoV-2 is high in slum dwellers, but what about the titer? Do they have a higher titer compared to... They have a higher titer, yes. They found that the cutoff, I said that their cutoff levels were higher compared to those that were in non-slums. Right, if there is no other question, then I will not um, bother you. So thank, thank you, you very much for your uh, kindly joining us. I will now like to move on to our next uh, topic. <clears throat> that is the problem of research in India. And for that, I'm very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Professor Konjaka Ghosh. Dr. Ghosh is a, let his uh, bio data be uh, projected, is, uh, is known to me for a long, long time. We were together, I was a junior assistant at the time he was in the Department of Hematology in PGI Chandigarh. Um, his uh, career is a little different than our usual career. He was a brilliant student in his medical college, but later he went for, uh, after that he went for um, MD in internal medicine at All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Um, from uh, medicine, he shifted to pathology. Immediately after that, he became, he joined the Department of Hematology. 
And uh, then if you see his uh, qualifications, you'll find that he is MRCP and MRC path together. And um, he's uh, known more as a hematologist, a clinical hematologist across the country. And he incidentally have retired as the chief of the National Institute of Immun Immune Hematology, Mumbai. It's an ICMR institute. And Dr. Ghosh throughout his career has been deeply engaged in research as I know that his interest um, is um, in all fields of medicine. It is not just hematology. And he has got a wonderful capacity to associate um, different branches of sub um, specialties of medicines together uh, with a wonderful knowledge of the fundamental physiology, biochemistry, uh, uh, pathology, microbiology. So whenever you talk to him, it is uh, always illuminating. So when I decided that I will make a session on um, Indian research, uh, I'm lucky Parvez agreed to speak about the first five best papers. And then I talked to Dr. Ghosh and requested him to give me a um, deliberation on problems of research in India. I feel that uh, though India is steadily progressing in medical research, but we have still a long way to go. Okay. If you look at the global literature today, um, the representation of China is far, far higher than us. Uh, there may be several reasons. I'm not going to uh, illum uh, I mean, talk on that, but uh, there are definitely some inherent problems in our country, why the Indian medical research is not coming up the way it should have come up. And Dr. Ghosh is one person who has been dealing with this issue. He's been in the research. He's been through this process long along his career from his, uh, from his, uh, way from after his post graduation onwards. So I am really delighted that he has agreed and I, it's my pleasure and privilege to request him to deliver. There's no time limit, sir. If, if you wish, you can talk for 60 minutes. Uh, your talk is the last talk today. So it's all up to you now. Um, Please, please deliver your talk. Times. So it's a huge, huge number. It just suggests that uh, the person is involved in, uh, in research and publication only throughout his own career. Uh, Dr. Partho Bhattacharya for calling me for uh, this Im very important meeting that is research and development in uh, medical sciences in India. Basically, uh, I have uh, I have been uh, as Dr. Bhattacharya has said, I have uh, taken several hats to look at the medical research in India as a researcher myself as an editor of uh, editor and advisory board member of several journals and uh, being a part of the icmr uh, various various funding processes so and uh, dbt dst's various funding processes i have a ringside view of how the funding happens in india if you ask me i will uh, i will tell you with uh, the research which is done at the MD level across the country, where we where the main problem begins. <clears throat> Basically, what happens? Everybody feels that in MD you don't have to do good research. You can just uh, write a dissertation, do a good uh, evaluation from the literature, and write something, and then submit and get away with it. But it was not like that in India. If you look from PGI and AIMS, there are several MD, MD dissertation papers, which actually is a part of uh, reference in textbooks of endocrinology, pulmonology, and other areas of medicine. So MD research can also be very good. I personally believe every doctor, apart from treating the patient, also should be a researcher at heart. And uh, Dr. Parvej Kaul has given you five very, uh, very good paper. He elucidated how these things are there. They are more extensive papers with funding from various agencies, various other places. Many people as Dr. Partho Bhattacharya has previously said that he has been dejected by the way funding is done in India. So that I will come later on, but let us see how you as a single person in medicine 
can start your research work. Broadly, every day in your busy schedule, I know that you see a couple of patients who actually at that point of time created some interest in you, but because of the heavy patient load, you forget it in the next day because next day you have another load of patients which comes. So if you want to be a researcher, you have to partly restrict this number of patients in some way. Everybody wants a lot of patients, but those who have uh, studied the book, uh, Final Diagnosis, many of us have read, it is an old book. You will see there the pathologist is telling that he has been overwhelmed by so much work that he could not study any of the recent advances or anything which has happened. So he has fallen back. This is something which all of us face in our life and we should not do. So you see, one of the simplest but not so simple research work you can start your life with is a case report. Case report is not regarded as a very, very good, good, good piece of research nowadays, but that is not true because many case reports have given us actually an insight about the disease process, sometimes an insight about the medicine. For example, when in 1962, people were dying, the soldiers were dying by fighting the Chinese army, more of them died due to high altitude pulmonary edema in the high uh, mountains of Ladakh and other places where the fight was going on. At that point of time, obviously every, every doctor in the army was treating these patients as bronchopneumonia. And uh, they were not doing well. Nothing was known about high altitude pulmonary edema. I am giving you two stories about that. One story unfolded in All India Institute of Medical Sciences, where uh, the de Department of Cardiology, the army people, the neurology people, the lung people, they all uh, took 23 volunteers who were catheterized at All India Institute at the base. They were taken to Ladakh and again recatheterized. This is cardiac catheterization. And then again catheterized after 20, 48 hours. And they collected a huge lot of data. And this data was later on published in New England Journal of Medicine. Cornell Grover was one of the first author of this uh, article, somewhere near 1964 or 65 it was published. It is a very good piece of work, solely Indian work, and uh, it first pointed out that there is a condition called high altitude edema. So it was a high, uh, it was a hi-fi work, which most of us will not be do, will not be able to do. But the soldiers. The, the doctors in the army, they had a finding, which was very important that though they were treating the patient as a bronchopneumonia, this patient basically were responding very well to LASIKs. So actually study started why LASIKs should reduce this. So that is in one of the ways you see that. For example, I will give you another example. In, uh, in the upper Assam, in Dibrugarh, you have uh, <clears throat> patients who come with lung shadow and uh, a proportion of them actually, almost all of them are treated for pulmonary tuberculosis and a proportion of them do not respond and they progress and they die. Till somebody had the uh, idea to look at these patients putam who are a little bit knowledgeable and they found a lung fluke. This lung fluke was never uh, before, before this was never discovered uh, or very rarely has been described from Indian subcontinent. And lung fluke has now become an, a reasonably exclusive, ex, 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 excludable cause of pulmonary shadow in upper, upper Assam. So these are some of the examples I will take the example of uh, Dr. Bhattacharya itself. When he was doing his MD, his boss gave him a thesis that he has to look into uh, glycemic index of certain foods, Indian foods. This was new then. It may be around 85 or 86. I don't remember exactly the date. 
and uh, Dr. Jenkins in London first uh, put that idea. But you see, we still do not have a very comprehensive idea of glycemic index of various Indian foods in our country, particularly so when we combine them. Suppose I know the glycemic index of rice is this much, but do we know that glycemic index of basmati rice, glycemic index of Govindabhog rice, glycemic index of many other rice are the same? We don't know that. Do we know that when you mix dal with rice, whether the glycemic load or glycemic index remains same? So you see, this does not this does not require a huge amount of uh, funding, huge amount of infrastructure. You can basically give the food, measure the glucose after several times. And if you are a little bit more into it, you can keep, keep the plasma and serum, do various types of insulin clamping, measure insulin level. This is for the higher level. But simply putting the glycemic index of different food, we do not have. We can do that. Many look at hot water epilepsy, which is one of the... Uh, one of the very rare and interesting causes of epilepsy from South India. Many myopathies have been described from South India. These have all been described by uh, basically uh, the clinicians which uh, have taken histories and which have looked into these places. Uh, from West Bengal itself, there had been uh, a good paper on, uh, on fatty liver who are not obese, so non-obese people having fatty liver, non-obese diabetic. So we have many examples. So the, the case reports, everybody can do. And case reports, actually, most of the editor will divide case reports as heavies and funnies. There are many case reports which are funnies or very rarely seen, normal thing, but very rarely seen. It is seen in Western countries, but not seen in, these are not the important ones, but there are heavy case report. You, look, you read the case report of Cushing syndrome by Cushing. He actually have uh, written a case report and they, that case report ultimately have elucidated the whole of the endocrine axis from pituitary down to adrenal. We did not know that. Similarly, there are these kinds of case reports ultimately ultimately is extremely important and you should be able to do by yourself. For example, Dr. Parvej have uh, recently uh, have just said about one of the pneumonia series, which he said, and uh, out of the 500 odd people, there were some 14 Legionella pneumophila patients. Uh, there may have been a lot of progress in pneumonia research. I do not know most of them because that is not my field. But one of the things which legionellosis uh, patients very early was noted into that they have inappropriate hyponatremia and uh, they have uh, basically a, a, a very abnormal liver function test, many of them. So these are not very difficult to do in your system and you can see whether then you can do the culture and other thing. Nowadays, there have been standalone uh, laboratories where even if you are not uh, able to do the test by yourself, you can send the sample to some of these big laboratories which can do the sample for you. You can even do the whole genome, but you will see that it, it requires money. Now question is where from the money will come. So one part is research and it starts with an, an unusual case which comes to you. Once the unusual case has come to you, your next part starts with how frequent are they in the community? You start looking into the community. So it gives you an epidemiological background of that unusual case. For example, <clears throat> in Ladakh, people have found a lot of pneumoconiosis, which uh, one of the ICMR Institute went there to study that why Ladakh, Ladakh should have pneumoconiosis. That study is still going on. It is an unusual location for pneumoconiosis because air is supposed to be clean. There should be nothing else available, but pneumoconiosis happens. So case, then you go to community. From community, you get the uh, a prevalence data. 
not only prevalence data, you also understand the various variations of the same case, like look at COVID. Now, initially COVID started as a pneumonia. Then as people started looking more and more into you, it, they said 20% people have myocarditis, some percentage people have uh, brain involvement, some of them have very altered blood sugar. Then uh, looking more into it, there was saying there was found to be one of the major changes in thrombohemorrhagic balance in the COVID patient, and that could be one of the mortalities. So it started with a single infection with a single virus, but as you looked into many patients, you start looking at the many facets. So somebody can is reporting on uh, your CT findings of COVID. Somebody is reporting on the uh, total, uh, the pulmonary uh, physiology of COVID. Somebody is looking at the blood protease activity, complement activation of the COVID. So it could be like that. So what I meant that any disease you take, any disease you take, uh, it could be, for example, I have a, I have an hypothesis. So one is case, then you go to community, community see you see the variation, then you start developing more and more solid researches, which some of them are basic, some of them are oriented towards uh, translation, and some of them actually you develop hypothesis. And uh, it, it goes into so many areas. For example, you already have drugs. If you look at COVID, almost every known drug in our, uh, in our pharmacopoeia over last one year has been tom tom means you have hydroxychloroquine, you have azithromycin, you have doxycycline and whatnot. So you have almost, then finally you have come back to steroid, ivermectin. So see, people are looking for it. So they are trying to say, which we now call repurposing of the drug, which uh, Dr. Partho Bhattacharya has done very successfully because we know that doxycycline is an, uh, has, a, an, has a protease inhibiting action. And we know that protease activity is very important in uh, emphysema generation, unrestricted protease activity. And that is very easily seen in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency patients where because of the non-availability of the protease inhibitors, uh, this activity actually increases. Now, hypothesis is also there that when somebody does smoking, the smoke itself inactivates alpha-1 antitrypsin and uh, you have an acquired, uh, acquired imbalance of protease and anti-protease in cases of chronic smoking, and that destroys lung. This type of thing also has been seen with another protease like antithrombin-3. There is a variant antithrombin-3, which is inactivated by smoking, and that patient actually develops uh, pulmonary emphysematous, emphysematous reactions. So, from that point of view, he has used doxycycline as an inhibitor of protease and very successfully in some of these patients. And uh, he has repurposed it and I, I gather he has written it in a very good journal. So main basic uh, idea is that now once you have developed hypothesis, then you probably cannot do it by yourself. You have to then have fund, you have to this hypothesis often involves many areas of expertise, which is not your own. So you may have to take the help of other institutes or other experts. Unfortunately, in India, sometimes you do not have expert in all the areas and they may not be able to, or they may not be in a position to help you uh, in the way you want them to. So that is one of the problem and you need funding. <coughs> Now, funding, uh, as I have seen, I have also faced a lot of problem in funding by the government agencies. There has been a problem. The problem is this. The problem is many times the people who decides who will get the fund, they themselves often have many projects or their own juniors have many projects. And uh, though there is a fig leaf that you go out, we are, dis we are discussing about whether this project will be taken or, or not. Yet, see, this I think is not ethically good. 
actually those uh, who are part of the committees uh, of the funding committees they should have nothing to do with uh, the fund being distributed to in, to their institute or to them or to their own known somebody who is there this is this is the major problem for which the the, the challenges are happening dr parvej is uh, fortunate because uh, he had a lot of international interaction which many kashmiris have because of different reasons and uh, many of indian doctors are there in different parts they are also eager to come back and do studies so they they tend to come to you and say that we will fund but here actually the problem is they just want the patient from you they do not want to involve you as an equal partner in the in in the process you have to see that you are actually an equal partner so that is one of the areas and it is not nowadays uh, tata also tata and birlas also have research funds and tata's funds are regularly sort of uh, advertised so that is separately done it is not a government funding and government now has restricted their funding in terms of focused areas of research M means they are not funding whatever you want to do that kind of research they are not funding so fund fund crunch is an important problem and uh, sometimes uh, you may have to take the industry's help but industry also will extract their pie i will tell you what uh, i have done for hemophilia research in india i i have been able to develop uh, along with my own hemophilia this is a patient society over the time with the patient society we have developed 91 chapters across india and uh, about that has about 25000 hemophilia patients and these hemophilia patients are very important source for my research and uh, out of some 150 research papers i have written most of them on hemophilia and bleeding disorder most of them have been uh, i got my uh, data from many of these patients who came to us uh, for this kind of action so this is something you have to look in many times doctors see epidemics doctors see various kinds of uh, other many systemic diseases they can work on that. Now, ICMR and DBT, they fund in two, three different kind of ways. One is they fund individual like a junior research fellow, senior research fellow. Here, the principal investigator does not get the fund. But uh, if the project is good, he gets a reasonable amount of money and can get his things work. And because it is lowest in the ladder, this SRF, JRF uh, money is relatively easy to get. I have already told you that most of these uh, government organizations research fund, almost 70-80% of the research fund is distributed uh, almost if you look at, because they are also, uh, com <coughs> they are also competent. It is, it is distributed to AIMS, PGI, CMC Velour, some KEM hospital, uh, Institute of Biliary Sciences uh, and uh, National Institute of Immunology and uh, various other transitional research institute of DBTs and DSTs. So broadly, you have very little left unless you join with one of them or some of them, you will have difficulty in getting fund from these sources. But senior and junior research fellows are something else. And another is if you have a godfather who is in the in the in, in the uh, in the committee, then they they can push some of the work and that can be funded. The pri private fund is only now in Tata and Billa. Other people has not yet started funding it, but uh, the area is 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 through CSR. Means if you can develop a project which is basically looking like you are helping a community with a research component built into it, then uh, the various companies have CSR component. For example, I'll tell you, uh, 
Coal India is funding lot of bone marrow transplantation for thalassemia patients. They are giving up to 10 lakh rupees. So those who want to work on bone marrow transplantation and they cannot get the fund for thalassemia patients. So they are going, they can tie over with this and, and can get into that. Similarly, for various lung diseases, you can develop your own uh, groups, companies, registries, and you can then develop the project. Once the project you have written, many times what happened, the project has to be uh, in a way sound in terms of what you are writing. It should be statistically sound. So once you have written the project, kindly vet the project. Let the project be presented to a third person before you send it to the uh, place where uh, you are asking for funding. And uh, another problem in these organization is inordinate delay. We have submitted a project. There is an inordinate delay for funding this project. So you cannot like, submit this project to anywhere else thinking that it can, if it comes, then that will not be ethically right. So this is what it is. There is another one. So these are project funds. Then you have the, the uh, these ICMR DBTs, they themselves have multi-centric project. So one of the ways to be a part of that multi-centric project, then you can get the fund. For example, I'll tell you, during uh, Prime Minister Bajpayee's time, he had a very prestigious project, which was called Joy Vigyan project uh, for science. And it was given to two or three uh, areas. One was thalassemia and hemoglobinopathies. And we won that project. We, we didn't won because we were ICMR. We won because we competed. But you see, after we won that project, we needed the thalassemia patient. We needed ground working people. We needed interaction. So we have to find out uh, whom we can get uh, to do these multicentric studies. So in Calcutta, we got Professor Utpal Choudhury and Professor Molloy Ghosh to do this study from Calcutta. Similarly, we got Dr. Cecil Ross from St. John's Medical College. So you can see these are all my known people. So this is one of the thing means another man in Calcutta whom I, does, uh, whom I do not know. He may argue that uh, I, I, I didn't get that project. Your friend got that project, but it happens like that. And that project uh, taught us many things. That project also, because today's talk is research and development. As you do the research, not only you develop yourself, you, you learn a lot of things, but also you develop the center in which you are working. So another program is uh, where we can say that ICMR pays it in a different way and uh, DBT pays in a different way. That is called center of excellence. So once somebody has one, two, three projects, then you can have uh, a center of excellence for five years where four or five projects can be lumped related four or five related project like in pulmonary area you can you can uh, you can lump like uh, covid acute covid presentation pulmonary then it's sequelae then uh, you look into if a, a proportion of patient where you can do bronchoscopy and if possible biopsies to see what happens to their lung so three, four projects related to pulmonary physiology and virus biology, if you put and then put as a, as a center of excellence study. <clears throat> so that can sometimes be uh, considered if you have previously had three, four, five projects, which you have satisfactorily, you have uh, submitted the project. Another way in Calcutta is, I hope most of the people are from Calcutta, which uh, myself uh, and uh, Dr. Malai Ghosh, Dr. Utpal Choudhury, and now to some extent, many other people are doing. Calcutta is, uh, ha has many basic science institutes. You have Science Institute of Nuclear Physics, you have Jadavpur University, you have Calcutta University's Institute of Science, Chemistry, then uh, Institute of Chemical Biology, like uh, Dr. Bhattacharya has linked himself to uh, IIT Kharagpur for certain kind of uh, researches. Uh, Dr. Prantar Chakraborty has linked to uh, the SN Bose Center. You have seen in the paper that they have come up with a, with a, a spectrophotometric 
surface measurement of hemoglobin bilirubin and uh, those kind of thing non invasive things so there are many high power institutes around calcutta and they uh, they do not get patients sample they don't get uh, to study the physiology and other areas of the patients which they want to do that so one of the areas those who are in medical colleges or certain other center is to forge the interaction with them and get them into this so that is another one once you have given a project and uh, so i said that case report community epidemiology variations then translational translational research in the form of a project then research which is hypothesis driven for example i have a hypothesis in uh, i am a hematologist so i have a hypothesis i have not yet been able to do that because may, i could not get the patients i know all of you would see these patients but i could not get for example dengue is killing many patients similarly hypercoagulation in covid is killing many patient my hypothesis is that we ha i have done lot of work on macro thrombocytopenia you know bengalis and eastern part of india almost 20 30 people of bengalis have slightly lower platelet count and slightly bigger platelets i have studied molecular pathology of the platelets in these patients and uh, there are several about eight or nine papers have been published on that the sum and substance of that is that these platelets are not are not totally normal they are not grossly abnormal but they are not totally normal so they are sub functional so whenever in a population you have that kind of uh, thing persist your question remains that why they are there in my population suppose now if i say that like in dengue macro thrombocytopenia produce a patient get less pathologic problem with dengue covid patients get less problem those who have macro thrombocytopenia myocardial infarction patient may be getting less extensive infarct or their frequency is less like if i take lot of myocardial infarction patients and look at their uh, just plain cv see nothing more and see how many of them have macro thrombocytopenia you can have a tentative kind of research in which you can say yes though in population macro thrombocytopenia is present in 30% of the patient in my myocardial infarction patient it is only 10% of the patient those who develop cardiogenic shock there it is only 2% of the patient who have macro thrombocytopenia so macro thrombocytopenia basically protects against many of the thrombotic insult which comes to us because of infections this will be there in pulmonary medicine also i am just giving an example this area i could not work i have retired now but this is an area which is very open similarly there are many areas on which you can work and the work is collaboration you should never think that because dr bhattacharya is working in this area he is taking away my research it is not like that in fact if you collaborate researches will always be better so once you have got the project then you have to give the progress report progress report also should not be all repetitions of what you have written in your project it should give what exact progress you have made and what what else remains to be achieved that you should uh, be able to do and once you have finished your research then comes how you publish it and where you publish it it is a problem that indian uh, good indian uh, findings are not often published in high power journals that there are different reasons for that but if you have a good finding try to publish it uh, as soon as possible and because there are hundreds and thousands of researchers who may be thinking in the same way as you are thinking so you must do that uh, in, in in that way so this is some of the some of the simple things uh, i had to tell you i didn't discuss about various kinds of trials models uh, various kinds of basic research but what i feel is that research should be the part and parcel of every every doctor's life it need not need not be an ivory tower research it can start with a simple finding of your patient sometimes you see drug side effects new side effects of a drug is a very very uh, very high power finding and you can always publish this kind of uh, your finding in new, in new england journal if it is new 
New England Journal of Medicine or Lancet. No doubt about that. Drug side effects, which are new, which have not been published. There are so many drugs are coming out every day. You must be looking at so many kind of uh, side effects, hypersensitivities. But how many of us actually write write that? <clears throat> I'll, I'll tell you. I uh, I I one of my relatives. He had a pacemaker implantation. My brother, and he was given linezolid. Within within uh, within hours of getting linezolid. he started getting a auditory hallucination of clicking sound hmm. uh, and uh, his blood pressure also shoot up these have been these have been written up but how many of us who are using linezolid have looked for hypertension mental changes because linezolid is a mau inhibitor also so how many of us have looked into that uh, i have written that uh, letter is lying in national medical journal of india accepted but for two years it is not published it will be published sometime what i mean is that look into that that is very good so research must and collaborative research always gives you better result initially once you have uh, done successfully few work and and build your credibility then you can get funding for a bigger projects try to uh, initially try to get uh, in a in a multi centric way with other people who are doing good research so that uh, later on you can uh, have your own project yourself right project to develop your in many of you are you are afraid many of you are afraid that you will be uh, you will be transferred <coughs> by government but i am sure that if two See, if you have a good project in in uh, to develop a particular department in your place, uh, in uh, in in at least fifty percent of the cases, your transfer may be halted uh, because there could be uh, there could be sane uh, there could be sane voices in the secretariat or ministry who will know that you are doing a good work. and so you cannot be really transferred because you are you are developing a place, and each of is each each of them you can develop your own department in your own way so i think i will stop here i have talked quite a bit if you have anything else uh, to ask me please do please feel free to ask me thank you uh, dr bartha uh, for giving me the opportunity Hello. Oh yeah, thank you, thank you. I understand that uh, people have enjoyed your talk and um, the way you have placed are just pearls uh, for us to understand. And those who are really willing to initiate um, some research, it will be very very helpful for them. So with this, I can make this open for the audience to ask you question if any. So Shikta, would you see if there is any question or not? Can 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 I make a point, Dr. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So so that was a fascinating talk by uh, Dr. Ghosh, and that actually uh, puts the whole thing into perspective: how to initiate and how to accomplish good research and. Uh, one particular thing i liked a lot about uh, his his uh, 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 what he alluded to was uh, the final diagnosis by author heli and that is uh, where the uh, where the pathologist the senior pathologist joe pearson goes him and and uh, asks the younger pathologist that is david cameron and as is written in the book that uh, there will be uh, times in your uh, uh, in in you know, in your practice that you will be called by the surgical colleagues by uh, as some people who are going to tell you what is the frozen report and that is the amount of work that will take you away from reading what is current so it is not long uh, what you will you will realize that what you knew yesterday has become totally obsolete today and you may be yeah. actually wrong and that is where he advises him 
that you shut yourself away from all what is happening around you and try to stay yourself current with whatever is happening around stay current at least it. give half an half an at least uh, give half an, an hour. hour every day to it, to to know what is happening around and what is what is, is new that is the essence of uh, staying current and probably getting interested in research all the time that was very nice dr ghosh that was excellent i i you you talked about macro thrombocytopenia and uh, and and, and uh, thrombocyte uh, and bigger platelets and low platelet count we have also actually experienced this phenomenon in in, in kashmir and we tried to f- uh, figure out the cause we could not find uh, the cause we looked at i actually uh, did uh, 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 some collaboration with uh, uh, with with uh, one senior hematologist from university of utah Uh, looking at this, and unfortunately, we could not lay our hands. So we looked at the MYH mutations. We looked at the morphology. We tried to look up, but finally, could not find an find a particular answer for that. So maybe uh, we share some kind of uh, uh, a similar uh, genetic uh, cause for uh, the macro thrombocytopenia that we see here in Kashmir, and probably that is seen in in the northeast. Ah, Doctor Call, Doctor Call. I'll tell you what we found. We have written about eight papers on macro thrombocytopenia from Bengal. Ah. They okay. are all published in Hemophilia, Platelets. These are all international journals of a reasonable standing. Broadly, what we found that single mutation in in a heterozygous form, in homozygous form, which causes severe platelet function defect in heterozygous form they produce a macrocytopenia with topenia all patients are not not totally symptom free yeah? okay so this this actually this actually we studied 300 macrothrombocytopenia patients from bengal we looked into initially as single gene mutations of those genes which we know cause plat- make platelet bigger like one at sulier syndrome and other things so we found that about 12% of these 300 patient have uh, this kind of mutation so it is not a it is not a homogeneous group then uh, we looked into we actually studied along with the sheffield university uh, the same sample using uh, various kinds of algorithms and we found that certain atp transporter genes abcg8 and they are they are they are abnormal in another 10% of the patients okay. and then we looked into uh, reductive hybridization so what we did is uh, we took the mrna of the macrothrombocytopenia patient and uh, hybridized it with the mrna, uh, MRNA of normal normal platelet from normal platelet and tried to find out which of the genes have been upregulated or more mrna is there three times more mrna is there and what we found that two or three groups of mrnas are this was published in uh, blood cells molecules and disease <clears throat> so okay. where we found that iron transporter gene see iron is a very important thing iron deficiency causes thrombocytosis there is a lot of debate about how iron deficiency causes thrombocytosis but it does so basically uh, we ca- we could actually detect in about 40% of this 300 patient some form of uh, defect of the platelet uh, functioning gene okay and uh, when we in the put in higher breeding and who are normal my theory is this like those conditions in which thrombosis is an important component they are probably macrothrombocyte because you have to one is you have to see why this macrothrombocytopenia should be present in certain population in high number in bengal it is very high previously people used to say it is due to mustard oil but we know it is not it's not to 
Interestingly, uh, Dr. Ghosh, uh, we also had a... Uh, this is all word. underlying IEPs which you mixed. So these three hand plugs like that. They are killing yeah, yeah. So basically what I'm trying to say, this is just an example. I'm telling that I could not get, even from Calcutta, I could not get enough dengue patient to study this particular uh, hypothesis of mine. There was no big power, there was no big power study. It was just doing uh, the platelet in the co usual counter. Suppose we take 200 dengue patient who, when they are recovered to see how many of them are macrothrombocytopenic. And uh, in the beginning, how many of the macrothrombo, how many of the dengue die? I have, we have about three or four papers from National Institute of Virology and myself on how dengue virus attacks the committed stem cell for platelet, how it enters the platelet, which antigen it actually engages. All these have been done and we have, we have published that. What I meant that basically for my brothers who were listening to this uh, webinar, because many times what people feel is that are a research means big things. You, are, you have also done very good research yeah. on various areas. They are not very big things. Yeah, Only thing true. you have to have time, you should read and start with simple things. Uh, so true. macrothrombocytopenia and COVID, nobody has written anything. <laughs> hmm. That's right. <laughs> That's true. And That's true. Um, see, I, I talked to my hematology junior in Bengal that can I get about 200 macrothrombocytopenia, I mean, COVID patient and their CBCs and they said, I am not allowed to go to the COVID ward. Oh, <laughs> No, I, we have a we have a database, and since you gave me the uh, lead, I'm I'm sure that I'm going to look at it definitely, because uh, we have a lot of macrothrombocytopenia. Nearly uh, seventy percent of our population has a thrombocytopenia count, which is uh, between uh, six seventy and and uh, one hundred thirty. So I think we should be able to uh, try to find, figure out the correlation. One more thing that was very common that, we, and that was common with Bengalis as well was. Uh, high prevalence of cardiac conduction disorders which required a pacemaker uh, implantation no no we have my brother has my brother has my, my grandfather has my brother's wife has they all uh, they all have pacemaker okay right Thank label you. any gris disease or something else <clears throat> that needs to be seen yeah, I mean, we want to find out if there is a link between the two because we have macrothrombocytopenia, we have a high prevalence of uh, uh, cardiac conduction uh, abnormalities and uh, and it was, as you rightly said, it was also believed that it could be somehow related to the mustard oil. So there may be a common link somewhere. Anyway, that is going beyond. I, I'll get in contact with you uh, privately as well. That may be beyond this. this uh, there is a bit of um, auditory disturbance, but... Uh, yes, I, have been to, I have to be doctor. Doc, doctor Call, I have been to Kashmir for selection of uh, your faculty for SKIMS. Okay, I have selected right. people for... I have selected faculty for hematology, blood banking. I have come... I have come with Dr. Rajan Tandon, who selected okay. the cardiology people. Uh, <clears throat> that will be in 1990s, basically. Okay. And uh, many of my Kashmiri friends are there. Dr. Zargar in endocrinology was there. Yes, yes, uh, yes. <clears throat> so many of them. Nice to see you, actually. <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much. So it's been nice seeing you too. Right. I don't Thanks know some of them. Dr. Bhattacharya for getting us together on the same platform. <laughs> my pleasure. <laughs> right, right. Bhattacharya has many unique uh, ideas. So he does. Uh, I am very, uh, I am very proud of him because whatever he does is uh, is out of the box, and yes. that is something something great. Absolutely. And Dr. Bhattacharya was telling why so many people are not listening to this webinar. I suggest Dr. Bhattacharya that in each webinar, you said new data, new new uh, news about COVID. Half of it you give in the beginning <laughs> of the webinar, and half of you give it at the end. At the end. <laughs> so you. Said that uh, all new informations on vaccinations and other things on webinar will be 
Good idea. idea. So, so it has been a wonderful evening. Uh, we have listened to um, uh, two tall uh, leaders in their areas and we thoroughly enjoyed Before some audio audio problems uh, audio problem some audio problem uh, i uh, congratulate and thank both my faculties and i thank my uh, guests who happen to be present in today's webinar